Pokemon Legends Arceus is a Nintendo Switch exclusive RPG that came out on the 28th of January 2022. I've been playing the game for over a week now, and I must say, I really quite like it. Before I get into the nitty gritty about what makes Arceus worthwhile, I want to speak about three other games and how your opinion on this title is likely to differ based on whether or not you've played them before. I am convinced that at its core, Legends Arceus is inspired by the Legend of Zelda series, specifically Breath of the Wild, and the Monster Hunter franchise. A lot of the design choices implemented here have been taken from those games. I also believe that a lot of the environments, particularly character models and Jubilee Village, were workshopped in Little Town Hero, another Game Freak game that I also enjoyed. On the surface, Legends Arceus is the evolution of the Pokemon games that we've been crying out for since Generation 2. In the years since, We've subsisted on a small drip feed of innovation, and it's not surprising that the way Pokemon games have chosen to evolve is to make a shift towards a tried and true formula, rather than to push the boat out for originality. This game is not going to redefine the future of gaming, but it might help shape the direction of this genre. In many ways, Legends Arceus is more of a spiritual successor to the Let's Go games than Sword and Shield. I feel this way because of the heavy emphasis both games have on catching Pokemon over battling. Sword and Shield are what I would consider games that slightly lean the other way, with Pokemon battles closer to the forefront. There are elements of both in each game, for sure, and both are aware of what the franchise's secret source is, the Pokemon themselves. To that point, you could throw this exact same game out with 150 brand new creatures that don't have Pokemon's familiarity or legacy, and this game would be mediocre at best. But Pikachu and the rest of the gang are here, and believe me when I tell you that counts for a lot. This story sees the player as a reluctant traveller who falls into the world of Pokemon with nothing but a smartphone and a can-do attitude. If you're part of Generation Z, please ignore the blatant overture that an entire dev team agreed that in a world with magical creatures that can literally breathe fire, it was beyond believable suspension of disbelief that a 15-year-old could survive for more than 30 seconds in a new world without a smartphone. Said protagonist joins a research team who are out here to research Pokemon, and to do that, you need to observe them doing things, beat them up a few times, and of course, capture them. As you progress through the game, you unlock new areas, new places to go and explore, and new methods of transport and traversal. This was not a game that felt good in handheld mode or using the Joy-Cons, and a lot of the navigation tools feel like they use the D-pad too heavily to switch between them, and fluid switching is what really matters here, particularly if you're trying to get from A to B very quickly. As such, I strongly recommend using a controller for this game if you have one available as it does put each button on the console to use frequently. The structure feels very Monster Hunter, with the exception that once you catch your target monster, you don't automatically return to base, and you don't need to spend 6 to 25 minutes beating it up first. You do get to roam around and gather items, resources, crafting Pokeballs and lures from berries and other food items. You also get Monster Hunter style side quests, which unlock new items to purchase and also to help improve your research level. There are a handful of side quests and a ranking system which goes up each time you research enough about a specific Pokemon. This is the replacement of the gym system where instead of collecting 8 gym badges, you level up your star rating. The element of the game that never stopped feeling Monster Hunter was certainly this research aspect, and no matter how far you get, if you've played a Monster Hunter game, you're going to think that this is a very watered down version. However, at the game's core, this is still a very Pokemon experience. There are turn-based battles and a light-hearted story that you can safely put in front of children without fear of driving up the cost of their therapy. The writing is exactly as you'd expect from this type of game. It makes a lot of reserved narrative decisions and uses anime cliches to create character diversity instead of writing truly unique entities into the story. Most of the exposition and dialogue is handled well enough, and the story is easy enough to track, but when I say this game pulls every punch it can when it comes to building a credible threat, I mean it. Rather than introducing the supposed rampaging Pokemon, which are your driving force throughout the story, uh, by showing them at a distance causing chaos, the first time you lay eyes on most of them are when you have to battle them and then ultimately quell their fury. As such, there's no time to build any semblance of a threat or any scale of what's going on in this world. This does create serious issues with the pacing, which is already shaky at best because the progression is entirely dependent on the player thanks to its new, more open world feeling design. You can pretty much accept the first post-tutorial quest and then smash the main story, or you can spend 15 hours running around and vacuuming up all the other Pokemon in the area like the completionist hoarder you are. The story does a good job of getting you to where you need to be for the real appeal, seeing more Pokemon, but it does fall flat when you ask anything else of it. 
So what do I like? I do like how this is a fully 3D, third-person RPG Pokemon game with open areas and that there are different ways to catch each Pokemon. While stealth survival crafting is such a generic gameplay trope at this point, it's barely worth a shrug. At least this is a stark contrast to what we've been doing for the past 20 years in Pokemon games. This game also doesn't punish the player for not having a friend who brought their game's sibling title to trade with. This is a self-contained, single-player adventure, and while trading is in this game, it is not necessary to complete the Pokedex. There's also a great deal of satisfaction to be found here, and many of quality of life changes that have been implemented, such as the ability to have moves taught to you and then change them on the fly, as well as the ability to search within boxes for a particular Pokemon. It's also a big plus that these Pokemon are in the overworld, and that they behave in new ways, such as running after food, sleeping, or attacking the player. The downside is that these behavioural patterns feel very much like the sort of early MMO spawns, where there's two or three pathing commands and then a simple targeting AI, but the wild Pokemon feel a little stunted intellectually, and they don't move far enough from their initial spawn locations that you get the feeling that they roam, or at least live in the world. In terms of environmental design, there are a large number of world objects, items, and interactables, but these feel utterly generic in design and implementation, like this could have been an earlier Atelier title. It's also amazing that you can unlock these great traversal options that help the game feel more expansive and provide a sense of scale. These feel like the proper evolutions of the HMs we've had for a long period of time. It's quite poor though that the areas of the game you can explore with these feel empty. These in turn expose the limitations of this graphical engine as environments rarely feel impressive or lived in. There's just a general lack of detail in the world and world objects, and while I would never argue that the Switch or Pokemon games have been champions of graphical innovation, if your goal is to create this specific type of game with this specific type of exploration and mechanical you know, backdrop, then a better job needed doing of hiding these rough edges. Perhaps my favourite feature implemented here is the change to the battle system. While trainer battles are now few and far between, battles with wild Pokemon are still a common occurrence. Moves and status effects have been retooled, which really helps make each battle feel different to the previous Pokemon games. The choice of being able to switch from an agile to a strong type move, at the expense of PP, inject an element of strategic awareness into the game that hasn't been present outside of the multiplayer competitive scene, or, for those of you old enough, Pokemon Coliseum. These changes are big positives for a franchise that was stagnating, and there are more battles in this game that can pose a real threat, if you go looking for them. On a related note, the game uses random numbers to roll the size of each monster in the world, with the largest size reserved for the most powerful alpha Pokemon. These are a sight to behold, not just because of their size, but because they're stronger than what you're generally likely to see around. Each alpha has about a 50% buff to offense and defense, so they can hit you and they can hit you hard. Most of these are placed at fixed locations in each environment, but after you've quelled each region's noble Pokemon, you can go back and get random alpha spawns at a low rate, which feels around 1 or 2% for each, each wild encounter. These are another good design choice to mix up the formula and give players who want a challenge one to aim for and rewards for doing so. The EV and IV systems have also been retooled to reflect this as an entirely single player game where multiplayer balancing isn't required. Overall, I believe that Legends Arceus is guilty of trying to find a way of putting what works for everybody else's game into their own, and does succeed in that implementation. Innovation does not have to be original on a global scale, it just has to be original in context. All of these mechanics and systems haven't really been utilised like this in previous Pokemon games, so it can clearly be classed as innovation. In fairness to Game Freak, this is what we've been asking for for 15 years. Yet for a franchise like Pokemon, this is still a poor showing in that this can be considered a step forward. I like this as a starting point, but it's not impressive or special, it's just good. Perhaps this is unfair to the Pokemon franchise, but look at what we got last year in Monster Hunter Stories 2. Can you really tell me it wouldn't be more fun to fly around on a monster that you yourself caught than a generic feeling braviary that everybody else has? Or to get a lift across the world on your shiny Alpha Rapidash? Is it really insanity to wonder why a spin-off title from a less financially successful franchise feels more alive? I'm of course aware that this would require extra work and time in development, but Game Freak are clearly willing to make changes at this point, so why not go all out? The next big step the Pokemon games need to take is to find a way to improve on this visually. Improve the environment, the density of the areas, and add an element of verticality and depth to these areas. It's not unfathomable in a Pokemon world to imagine diving under the water with your favourite Pokemon and seeing an entire habitat unfold beneath the waves. 
You could take your favourite water companion in search of treasure and rare mons on the seabed, or swim around a shipwreck or dive into a trench to battle a deep sea legendary like Kyogre. Similarly, it's easy to imagine walking across thick jungle canopies in search of tree-dwelling Pokemon and flyers, or even navigating platforms high within a dense forest, or soaring above the clouds to a mythical floating island filled with dragon Pokemon. Everything here just feels like you're finding a faster way to get around on the same level plane, even though there are raised elements and subterranean elements. There just isn't enough real estate high up in the air to feel any other way, and a lot of the awful looking, barren textures are at the top or the edges of the world. My suggestions are not impossibilities to pull off, even on the limited hardware of the Switch, and their absence speaks to a great host of missed opportunities. I'm also convinced it's time to do better in terms of making Pokemon feel like actual living entities rather than clumps of data. Why were there not any dynamic interactions here? Even something as simple as seeing a horde of Starly fly in a V-shape high above the ground would help. Looking up in this game gives you an impressive cloud palette, but no Pokemon seem to live there, aside from the handful that are placed in specific locations. I do want to stress that this game is not empty or bad. In fact, I'd consider it quite good if the main appeal of the Pokemon games for yourself is catching and collecting. If you're into the competitive scene, this game might only serve to feed your Pokemon Home account for an upcoming title. It's unfortunate that I'm left feeling like there's so much room between where this game is and where the current ceiling for a modern gaming experience should be, and I don't think it's unreasonable to demand more from a franchise that is unequivocally the best-selling JRPG of all time. You might think that I'm being overly harsh or critical, but I've been waiting for this kind of game since I was seven years old and the original anime launched. This product delivers on my original dream from the late 90s, but once more fails to truly account for what's changed in the gaming landscape in the interim. This is a good Pokemon game. This might be one of the best Pokemon games ever, but in the hierarchy of a modern gaming experience, this is lacking in more ways than one.